Live from the University of Texas at Austin, the Liberal Arts Development Studios present Essentials of AI for Life and Society. And now, here are your professors, Joy D. Fizwas, Don Fizel, and Peter Stone. Hi, I'm Peter Stone, and welcome to, uh, to today's class session. So just for a little bit of context, as you know, up till now, we've talked about sort of an intro to AI and the AI methodologies, symbolic and probabilistic and, and recent neural machine learning kinds of methods. Um, one of the uh, requests in your weekly reflections has been more connections to real world applications. And for the next three weeks, that's what we're gonna do. Today, computer vision, we'll have a robotics session and a natural language processing session. So today we have the good fortune of having one of the world's leading researchers in computer vision, Professor Kristen Grauman, got her PhD from MIT in 2006, has been here on the faculty since then, and um, will, will tell us about the fundamentals of, of computer vision, um, and with especially, as you saw in the readings, um, some uh, connections to the real world applications. So take it away, Kristen. Great, thank you, Peter, and welcome everyone. So glad I could be here and be part of this. When I heard this class was starting and what it was about, I was so excited. What a great idea. Then when I heard I was being asked to put 30 minutes to explain my whole field, I thought, oh, this is, <laughs> this is a new challenge. But let me, let me show you what I've got um, to try and give you a very high level view of what it means to work in computer vision, why it's still hard, but what things can we already do, and what is it enabling, as Peter said, in the real world today. So what is computer vision? Let's start with like, the top level definition of what we mean when we talk about a computer that has vision. So the simplest explanation I could give would be to say computer vision means having an automatic understanding of images and video. You could also go further and say, well, it must require then computing properties of what is a 3D world from what is often 2D visual data. And the final thing I would give at this top level definition is we mean the algorithms, the representations that would allow a machine to recognize, parse, understand, objects, people, seen, and activities. So that's a working definition for us about what it means to have a computer with vision. And it's really important to say from the start that computer vision doesn't sit in a vacuum with respect to many other fields within AI. In fact, there's close relationships we could spend you know, new sessions on talking about how computer vision meets robotics or machine learning, cognitive science, or the others that you see here. And this is, in fact, one of the great properties I think for many of us working in the field is how it lends itself well to being and requiring an interdisciplinary kind of treatment. So then let's go back to this ground slide from the course, which is giving a definition of AI in terms of you know, what you see here. And I highlighted a few parts because really all of these apply when we think about the current challenges in computer vision, meaning sensing, but also learning, reasoning, and even taking action. And I'll be showing examples today, you know, what, what can that mean? So first let me say a bit about why does it matter? Why does studying computer vision matter? Why will it matter for the world? And you can start to motivate this, first of all, from the sheer volume of visual data that exists in our myths that we create, that scientists create. I guess that even animals can create. And this is not slowing down. It's as big as it's ever been, meaning the, the flurry, the flux of visual content that's so important for its meaning, for its scientific discovery, for the memories and communication that it can allow. Here are just a few stats that, again, are really just growing in time, but mm, you know, 270,000 hours of new video is added to YouTube today, according to the stats when I looked up recently, and half your brain is devoted to processing visual data. And I mentioned these numbers at just small glimpses of just what complexity, scale, volume of information is there that, yes, we need computers to come in, and AI in particular to come in, to be able to really organize and really make accessible. So then, let's talk about those um, applications in one slide here. Um, what becomes possible once we have computers that can see? In autonomous robotics, so robots that are not controlled by us but really can make their own choices, do their own movements, and act in the world, we need full perception, and a lot of it really is visual. If you look at the top middle, look, thinking about organizing visual content, this could be uh, personal content, 
or commercial content. So the ability to scour through, mine through, and find patterns or matches among content that really is best understood in its visual form, maybe not other forms of metadata. On the top right, science and medicine. So I kind of alluded to how new discoveries sit and even are locked up in visual data until we can process it at scale or process it in new ways and across different modalities. On the bottom left, gaming, uh, augmented reality. There's great new opportunities that are emerging and taking hold um, to change the way we might interact with the world in daily life through the future of augmented reality devices, um, as well as in entertainment, such as um, video gaming. Bottom center, surveillance and security. This is a long-standing strength within um, computer vision and processing, the ability to um, understand content for what's there, but also why and what's unusual or anticipate what might be next. And then on the bottom right, personal photo and video collections. I bet many of us in the room, this is already a day-to-day -day application, and there's, there's more in this direction that computer vision continues to enable. All right, so we surely need it. Uh, we surely care about computer vision as a core pillar of artificial intelligence. And I wanted to then you know, next start talking about why is it difficult, and kind of a, uh, a stage setter here is to think about um, the fact that at least originally there was maybe less understanding of just how difficult it would be. So this is a famous paper from MIT in dated 1966 where they referred to something called the Summer Vision Project. Well, this is very early days thinking about how over the course of a summer there would be a project to construct a visual system um, that would understand images automatically. And you're, you know, here we stand now in 2023. We know there's a, a tremendous progress, which I'll highlight in a moment, but this certainly wasn't a summer project, right? And for many of us, hopefully, you know, and beyond lifelong projects. So then, yeah, why is this, why is this true? What, what is hard about having computers understand images and video? So I'm gonna take you through a number of the challenges. And in doing this, I hope it reveals the depth of the problem area, and also perhaps what it might mean for the core tools or the core models that are going to need to be there in AI and in computer vision specifically in order to cope with these real challenges. So the first one I highlight is robustness. If you think about it, what's today even a more, more controlled task like recognizing objects and images, um, keep in mind the same object or instances of the same object category are gonna give you a whole different set of pixels every time you see them. And that's because of all these parameters that can change that don't matter so much for recognition, but do change the image. So the lighting, where is it? The object pose, how is the body situated with respect to the camera? Um, how does this instance look relative to any other? We call that intra-class appearance variation. Clutter, all those things in the image that aren't about the signal you're trying to read. Occlusions, things that block objects. So robustness is a challenge. Um, here's some other very, like maybe less expected challenges when you start to think about even understanding objects and semantics of images, one, of, one important aspect to take note of is that it's really not literally only about the pixels you see as far as understanding visual content. And I can give you an example here that illustrates it well. I mean, if you glance at that patch of pixels on my side, I'm thinking probably you're not sure what it is. I've heard all kinds of guesses in the past, like teeth or dirty teeth or um, some wood. Okay, well, what is it? I'll show you an image where it came from, and now I think you probably have a much better understanding of the likely identity of the patch I was showing you. It's the one, um, the, the small brown patch sitting under that tent. Uh, in this case, it's a, it's a basket at a picnic. So this is to show you that it's really not just about what you could see, but how you understand the fullness of an event, a scene, and inter-object relationships. And this is always there when we're understanding the visual world. The other way in which it's so important to think about broader context is illustrated here. These are all chairs, wonderful, and in fact, they actually look pretty similar. They have similar color, structure, and even a little bit of viewpoint similarity. But these are also chairs, and you and I can say so with ease, but the thing that defines them, again, is not the literal pattern of the pixels. Um, it has to do with the function of the object. It's something you could sit on. And so if you take that kind of understanding, you can start, I think this is a great point, where you can start to see that bridge between not just computer vision and sensing, but computer vision and reasoning, you know, and other parts of AI. Working along this trail of challenges, here's another one, that a thought exercise for you, um, which is to make the point that um, today, as we'll see shortly, 
today's modern algorithms and computer vision can do really amazing things when they are trained very heavily, meaning with lots and lots of instances to learn from. Um, but we humans don't require that, and machines should not either for many applications we care about. So the world in which you could learn from few examples is called low-shot learning. So low-shot means low chances, few chances to encounter the thing you're trying to learn. And I'm going to give you a one-shot learning task, which is to learn this category that I think many of you don't know yet, which is a pod -a -pod. Uh, Here it is. That's one example. And then here is a, a painting where drawing where you can look for pod -a pods And I'm hoping that as you kind of scan this scene, you may actually do some one-shot recognition. Is anyone finding the pod -a pod in this scene? I see some nods. Yeah, so maybe towards the bottom, looks like there's one holding something on its head, if you will, and another one that's crouched down. And you know how, how magnificent, right, that you can do this kind of one-shot recognition. There's certain properties of the object um, that you clued on. It's not an exact match, but here you go. Machines today are not, not there. Um, other challenges, 2D observations of a 3D world. So you may have noted, um, even in the reading, kind of the strong relationship between the 3D model you know, the actual 3D content of the world and then our 2D observations of it. And of course, there's a, uh, an ill-posed problem there if we're trying to understand 3D shape or reconstruct 3D things from only a single view. Um, and yet, priors could help us to do this. And furthermore, once we have multiple views and we bring in elements of geometry, we can start to reconstruct and estimate how these cameras were different in the real world such that we understand the 3D structure underneath. Um, but this is kind of doing that inverse problem going from 2D observation to a 3D uh, estimate. All right, so I want to tell you that, well, lots of challenges for sure, but today's models can learn many scene and object understanding tasks quite well. Um, so if it were a model today were to look at an image like this, it could say things very well about it's, being, it's in a living room, there's a baby, there's a dog. Even here are the pixel level outlines of them. This is called a segmentation. Um, and even some things about 3D structure in the scene, about where objects are, and even 3D detection of those objects. This is really important progress, in fact. Um, but the last set of challenges I want to highlight is what if when the scene comes alive? So I think we'll all agree that saying the things we just said a minute ago are not enough to understand that scene. And video brings so many new challenges uh, for visual understanding. And I've sorted them here into three clusters, the ones that really stand out and are pushing the field. Um, dynamics, human activity, cause and effect. You saw that happening there. Um, in the middle, multimodal sensing. The audio in that one is great, right? And it has a lot to do with how we understand that scene and the event. And on the bottom right, video brings to the forefront scaling challenges that we haven't really mastered yet in the way we perhaps have at the image level, looking at an individual static scene or one moment in time uh, separately. OK, so big challenges then resting in video. And we're going to come back to that today. So the next segment I wanted to say, well, where are we now? So I hope that I've shown you a bit, you know, what is computer vision? Why would it be a great thing to achieve in its fullest form application-wise? And then what, what are the, just the intuitive challenges? Why making a machine have vision um, would be difficult. So then let me show you a bit. Where is the field now, or where have we come? So we look back over time. You know, again, in this little chart going back to the 50s, um, you have this progression from when you could first get a digital image to um, first attempts to try and connect a computer to a camera to describe what's there to the 80s, where you had precursors of the modern, what are called convolutional neural networks. So um, deep, deep uh, neural networks with many layers that are looking at images um, to learn patterns within them or detect patterns within them. And again, precursor of what a lot of models are doing today. Um, into the early aughts, where faces came to um, a lot of maturity, meaning understanding faces and images, being able to detect them despite the fact everyone looks a bit different, still being able to find faces reliably in images, that's a very big win, to like 2012 plus, so the last 10 years or so, where if you see on the bottom right of that graphic, three very important things came together um, to allow us to tackle not just limited, you know, one category at a time, like a face, but 
thousands of categories in the world um, uh, as, as really benchmark well in that top plot as the error went down and down and down very fast on a classic challenge called ImageNet, which was, again, to recognize thousands of object categories. And those three things that came together, big label data sets, so images with labels saying what they are to feed these AI algorithms that start to learn the patterns of their appearance, together with deep learning, um, these deep convolutional neural networks, and GPU technology. And this really was like a, a renaissance moment or a, a, a spike moment for the field to have these things you know, that didn't come out of nowhere, but building them up in just the right way, bringing them together, that allowed a lot of recent progress um, and successes in the field. And so then, what are the kind of things that do work best today? And, this is non exhaustive. Um, and what was fun about making this slide is that, you know, I think early in my academic career, I gave maybe quite a bit of talks about what is computer vision, and maybe less so more recently. So when I came back to think about materials I had, well, I was like, well, this needs a complete redo because so much has happened and there's really great progress um, that I can now try to highlight for you here beyond what was there when I, when I was early, um, early faculty here. So yes, still optical character recognition, OCR. So your handwriting on any mail you send is generally 98% or more just automatically recognized by machines today. Face detection, which I alluded to already, and also key point tracking. Think about maybe you are a friend using these apps where like, you do things, fun things with your face and then an avatar does something in response. That happens because the, the vision can see some key landmarks on your face and understand how it's moving accordingly. 3D reconstruction of scenes. This is so powerful. So I alluded to that 2D, 3D relationship, and today's models are really excellent about being able to take um, imagery and other sensing, but even imagery alone, throughout a 3D space. Here's a, a dollhouse view of a multi-level home building, um, and then stitch them together and understand the relative geometry in order to reconstruct what's underlying in 3D. Recognizing object instances. Have you ever used a mobile device to search for a product, even by how the product looks? Um, that's possible because of very reliable matching of local parts of the image um, that can be repeatedly and dis distinctively found among many, many other photos to retrieve the object you care about. Recognizing object categories. Now, this is one of the bigger wins that's newer in the last 10 years. So not just saying, you know, here's the, the product or the mug I'm trying to buy, um, but here's something, and it's a dog, even though we know dogs have famously very varied appearances. Medical image analysis in certain problems, certain domains, semi-automated um, and assisting experts um, with this kind of intensive computation and, and smart ways to find structures or abnormalities. And then finally, I'd highlight vision-aided navigation, um, both for cars, like autonomous vehicles, as well as for robots who need to move for example, in the 3D spaces that you see in the top right of my slide. So a non-exhaustive, but I think very exciting list of things that many of us in the room or online are encountering in our day-to-day -day life. So what's the next frontier? That's what I want to talk about for the remainder of our time, um, is my view about what is the next frontier for computer vision? Where are these core challenges taking us? And what are the kind of problems, kind of things we might attempt to, to push that frontier further. And for this, I'm gonna talk about a divide between current perceptual experience as far as a computer vision model goes and where we need to go in, uh, in a first person visual experience. So what do we do today? Well, often, um, as I'm highlighting here through a, an array of really important and influential data sets of images and videos that have been kind of a test bed and a training resource for AI in computer vision for, for years now. These kind of resources are what we call third person. They're images, videos that are taken from a spectator point of view, just the way you and I would always often you know, take our pictures or videos, because these are collected from usually online collections um, of just that sort, and then organized according to, to parameters, labels that, want, that the systems want to learn. But let us pay close attention that this is a different, this is a certain view, right? And two things I want to call out. One, it's curated. Um, it's disembodied. So it's curated, meaning these are all really important, tend to be really important moments in time where someone chose to take a video or chose to take a photo. Um, and secondly, it's disembodied because once these visual glimpses get their way into data sets that AI is going to learn from, 
they're out of the context of the moment. They're out of the context of the physical space where it was happening. happening. So it's a, it's a glimpse that's now become disembodied from any sort of agent or behavior um, or scene context. OK, so I'm saying you know, this is an important realm, but one that we actually need to move past. And I think what's so exciting is to think about the challenges that arise when, rather than that third person spectator view, we have a first person, or what's called egocentric, point of view. So what does that mean? Egocentric, first person, it means a wearable camera. Here it's worn by a person on their head who's going about some daily life activity. And what you see from this point of view is everything they see. And if you're recording audio, it's everything they hear. And what's so special about this, and what I want to contrast from the previous slide, is now you're talking about uncurated content. It's, it's not a special moment. It's every moment, right? everything that was happening in front of them. It's long form video. Um, in the field today, models are often worried about an image at a time, or maybe a few seconds of video at a time. These kind of devices would offer hours of content, ultimately. Um, and so it's a long form video stream. And most importantly, this is embodied. right? So this is an observation that's inextricably linked to the agent's goals, their interactions, and their attention. Okay, you can see that, you know, the things that the person's reaching for, what they're looking towards, where their attention goes with their head, if not their eyes, this is what we're gonna pull out of a visual experience like you see here. So that's an opportunity for computer vision that goes really, I think, a whole leap deeper um, than what we can do in these disembodied observations. And so I wanted to talk about, in the remaining, kind of three examples in research about problems and a bit of progress, really at a high level, towards first-person um, visual understanding. And I broke it into three parts, uh, data, affordances, and multimodal learning. And we'll look at data first. Okay, so if you, if you caught that earlier slide about you know, the spectrum of data sets, I said they're all third person, very important, but not hitting the, the, the egocentric experience that I'm talking about. Okay, well, let's look at what egocentric video exists. This is, relatively speaking, a younger area with younger resources or you know, newer resources for the field. And I'm highlighting what, as of 2020, was the best around in terms of egocentric video data sets, a sampling. And it, you know, these are important. You can see, nonetheless, that they're relatively limited in scale. So you're talking about limited number of people, as many as 45 at the most, who have worn cameras to put the video into one of these data sets. Uh, and you're talking about often almost entirely indoor environments um, and even in kind of confined setting, maybe a lab environment or only a kitchen. Now, this is so important to note and even start with the data question because as I hope you've kind of seen through earlier sessions of this course, um, today's AI is, um, you know, very much of it needs to be fueled by high quality data. Whether it's labeled or not, um, the data that we give to the models we're trying to train is going to dictate what they're possible, what they're able to learn. So we looked at the state of affairs a couple years ago, saw this, and said we need to build an effort um, that will be really much greater, orders of magnitude greater, in terms of scale and content and diversity. And that led to an effort called Ego4D. Um, let me show you what I mean by scale. So in terms of number of people who wore cameras in a given data set, if you treat that as a vertical axis, and in terms of number of hours of video content, if you treat that as the horizontal axis, then the greatest, biggest data set that existed at the time would carve out the rectangle in red, okay, carve out that area. If you took all the video data sets we knew about at the time for egocentric video, it would be this big. Um, and so what we introduced um, just over uh, almost two years ago now called Ego4D um, is an order of magnitude in both those dimensions larger. And what is this? It's a resource that contains more than 3,000 hours of in the wild daily life activity. It's collected by unique individuals from about 74 worldwide locations. In fact, um, covering five continents and nine different countries, nearly 1,000 different people. And it's multimodal data. So I'm gonna emphasize a lot the video because yeah, um, we're looking at these video challenges, but as I motivated earlier on today, so much of the field is um, at soft boundaries with other areas, and that includes the need to think about sensing in a holistic way across audio, motion, um, and in 3D uh, context. So the data itself is multimodal, has those aspects, and we'll get to this benchmark task to catalyze research. So this is a new introduction to the field, and it's not work from me. 
alone. This is the work of a very large consortium uh, of universities and industry lab that you see here. Um, and why is this so important to take note? Well, one, it's, you know, it's a great collaborative effort. You have experts across the field um, from these different spots. And second, for the purpose of making a representative or you know, a closer to co geographic coverage covering data set, um, having camera wearers recruited around all the local places among these different institutions meant we could gain a lot of diversity. So what, is some, what does Eagle 4D look like? Here are some clips. And here's where I can really explain, what do I mean by in the wild daily life activity? I mean, that's something we all do, right? We, we all have daily activity. It's pretty much in the wild. Um, that's what I mean here. It's just unscripted content of people doing the things they'd be doing anyway. Um, no performing, no acting, no trying to do certain activities. Um, just trying to capture daily life. And that is um, important because we want to think about problems in both robotics and uh, augmented reality, where robots of the future would be learning about how to use human objects, human created objects, how to work in human spaces. Augmented reality devices should be learning how to assist us in our daily lives, going about our mundane stuff like work and leisure and school and home and so on. And so that's what these glimpses are, just little excerpts from the 3,000 plus hours that were captured by these uh, 930 plus people. And you can see there's also the variety and in the indoor, the outdoor, and the geography, the weather. And this is all extremely important um, to break free of what was, what was possible in the existing data sets to learn. OK, now just as important as having nice data is to know what research challenges to tackle with it. And so the Eagle 40 um, benchmark suite, what this is, is a set of research challenges that the team set up in order to span the space of things you need to be able to do um, in order to have intelligence with this first-person perspective. And these tasks move from the past to the present to the future. Let me say a little bit about each of those classes. So from the past, imagine having uh, an assistant that from maybe your wearable glasses of the future, like wearable computer on your glasses, that is your perfect episodic memory, meaning you could ask it questions about your daily life activity that you need to know to remember. Famous example in our realm is something like, oh, where did I leave my keys? Um, but this could be anything about your past experience that you're wanting to call to mind um, by asking questions of a video. Huge challenges here. That video is going to be very, very long. Your question could be any arbitrary sentence that you want to know about. And so think about that question answering challenge that you need to address for it. Moving into the present, there are tasks looking at hands and objects. When you wear a camera, the things you do with your hands are up close and center. And in fact, a lot of daily life activity um, ha involves complex hand object manipulations. I think you saw that in some of my examples before, using tools, cooking, folding origami, um, interacting with an animal. And so there's tasks looking at answering this question of what am I doing now and how am I doing it? How am I manipulating objects? And I sh um, this is a place in which we're seeing great kind of possibilities for transla translating what people know how to do and uh, into what robots know how to do, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Finally, uh, well, we're still in the present, looking at social-related tasks. So imagine this first-person experience of your daily life and then being able to answer questions like who said what when or who was paying attention when I, um, when I, uh, when I was speaking or who was I paying attention to. And then finally, into the future, we have put up tasks for this data that requires models that can answer what will the person wearing the camera do next. And if you think about it, that's an interesting question, again, going beyond exactly what the pixels show, right? Um, maybe the pixels show that you're putting water on the beans. Um, anticipation or forecasting means able, being able to reason or anticipate what's the next thing that now probably will happen and how important that is for, um, you know, again, an augmented reality assistant that was going to help me with my life or, or, or a robotic agent that needs to think ahead about its own next actions. All right, so I mentioned those tasks. These are out in the, in the real world in the sense of researchers have dug into them across three challenges now over the last two years, um, not just the researchers and the teams I mentioned, but across the field. Um, and so what that means are these kind of formal challenges. So um, run, run in a systematic way, kind of there's here's what the data you're allowed to train with, here's the data that you should test with, there's hidden answers, all the models need to compete. And then we really find out what is the status of the best the field can do on any one of these challenges. And this is one example of a challenge in computer vision um, that's having some good traction so far, 
um, but there have been many very important ones. In fact, when I alluded to the progress even 10 years ago with ImageNet as a benchmark, this is another earlier precursor of kind of a big data resource, so it's press, big data resource pressing the field into competing with each other and, and having better results um, for the literature as a result. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, computer vision is interdisciplinary, or it has soft boundaries at the very least with many other areas. And we're seeing this play out in terms of how this egocentric visual perception resource of Ego4D is being picked up in the community. So yes, there's lots of great adoption um, that we're seeing in computer vision itself, um, but also in robotics, where agents are now learning better visual representations because rather than train solely on kind of lab-oriented imagery or imagery from the disembodied view that I showed earlier on the web, they're seeing the kind of everyday, mundane, human environment stuff that we all do and from the first-person perspective. And that's had some measurable results that help in robotics. Um, and the other to highlight is psychology, um, where I hope you might imagine you know, the link between our own human visual experience as observed in this video and what we could hope to read out of it about um, eventually, you know, developmental learning or cognitive science questions about our attention and our action and our um, anticipated behavior. All right, so I've shown you then data foundation example in this new realm or, you know, urgent or important realm of first person perception. Let's then talk briefly about affordances. So what is an affordance? Uh, and then what are we gonna do with that <laughs> information? Let me motivate this, and I, it's, um, it plays very well with this kind of first-person experience of perception. And in fact, um, a strong motivation for it is at the pushing the, the boundaries or the capabilities of today's robots. So I put a little picture down there of the robot working in a human-oriented space. If it's going to do that, it needs to know how to use human uh, objects and also even navigate in human spaces. But let's think about using objects. So computer vision for some years, at least some years prior, had the, uh, a very important major goal of being able to name objects and images. And I'd like to say, you know, we can do that now. I guess we've established that even in this talk. Um, and it's not enough, right? So if you look at objects in the world, knowing what to call them is nice, and it'll do certain applications, but particularly in areas like robotics, you want to know how they work. And so when we talk about affordances, we're talking about the potential for action. So can I go from naming an object to understanding how to use it? And yes, there's a visual element there. We'd like to be able to look at an object and see parts that suggest certain behaviors I can do. Like, I could toggle it here, I think I could adjust this, or this is where I would pick it up. So on the right, then, that's where we, we would like these models to be headed. And existing methods to do this take a fairly um, recognition-like or kind of supervised approach where they would ask people to you know, even label images, say, well, where would you hold this lamp? Where would you toggle? And you can imagine kind of annotating, teaching an AI system about that. Um, but what we thought is that's really indirect because um, you're putting a lot of faith that someone can imagine how they use an object and then write it down. And it's expensive to train that way. So what we've been looking at is how you can learn affordances directly from video. So let us just watch humans in their natural habitat and see how they manipulate objects. If we have video understanding models that can start to pick up on these usage patterns, then we can make predictive models that can say this, uh, you know, anticipate what those regions are gonna be like in new images and video. So here's one of our models at work called Interaction Hotspots. You see that color coding at the bottom, those are a number of different afforded actions. So some places might be cuttable, they'll be red, or they might be mixable, they'll be green. And as I go through here, you can see that in this particular clip, um, this bowl looks mixable, even though the person's not mixing it yet, um, as did you know, another pot there sitting on the stove. Uh, adjustable, so it looked like the faucet looked adjustable to this model that we trained, and the, the knife on the left looked washable, though it hasn't been washed yet. So it's this notion of anticipating what actions are possible and where to do them. Another example, the pot is mixable, those jars look openable, and so does that door in cyan there that's openable. And the model's anticipating this. In my last example, I wanna contrast on the right, the affordances like I've been talking about in our hotspot predictions, and on the left, traditional, what's called saliency. And saliency would mean, well, where are the important kind of interesting regions in this image or video, which can do certain things, but um, affordances are actually something different and, and arguably richer, because it's saying not just what looks interesting, but where are the places I can take certain actions. And we're learning this from humans directly, 
with the idea that we can then translate it to robot behavior. Okay, so in particular, think of a dexterous hand robot, one with uh, 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 you know, many degrees of freedom in the fingers, a multi-finger robot who's trying to use human objects. So dexterity is required but, um, to use these objects in the world, but it's a highly complex action space. And so the question is, can we learn faster by paying attention to how humans, humans do things? And here's a research um, um, task and some results where using video like I've been showing you, being able to anticipate these affordance regions and also know where the hands are, estimate where the hand human hands are in the video, can start to train robots faster. So a robot that's using reinforcement learning here to try and pick up different objects um, can start to do it faster and, and in a more human-like way in the bottom right using this kind of model paying attention to visual affordances compared to the other things you might do like just reinforcement learning purely where you try to bat it around until it starts to work um, or using even specific imitation uh, sequences or sequences that you want to imitate uh, like on the bottom left. Okay, And so measurably this speeds up learning, that's what these charts are showing. So with less time in the world, less time with the robot using up different actions in the real world, it can still pick up successful behavior. And the sharper the curve here, um, that's more what you're seeing. And the models I'm talking about using affordances are there shown in blue. All right, so I've talked about using the hands, figuring out how people use hands from video, and then using that to help a robot agent start to learn new tasks. Um, the other part of the body is unfortunately really hidden from an egocentric camera. Did you notice, right? So if the camera's looking out from my head, most of my body's never visible. And yet we care about the posture of the person or the, what's called the body pose over time. And so this is a, a, a result looking at how you might start to learn the structure of the video on the left, which does not see the body very much, but then still recover what is that 3D body pose behind the camera. Right? So we call it the invisible pose, um, but there's that structure that's learnable in the video to figure out how your body's moving behind the camera. All right, so the final example, then let's talk about audiovisual, um, multimodal learning. I'm going to give you an example from audiovisual that's well motivated from augmented reality. Have you ever been in a busy place and you're trying to listen to one person and then, but many people are talking? This is called the cocktail party problem. Humans can do it okay, um, where we can focus our attention to just one speaker. And in vision and in audiovisual learning, we're starting to figure out how to build models that can do that and probably even do it better than you and I can do. And so I wanted to tell you a little about that work. We'll look at an example. Um, right now, if you train a, a, a model using a premise called mix and separate, you can learn how to recover the original audio signal um, from one video after observing it in a mixed signal. So if you took two videos and added together their audio, then you could train a model to recover the original audio um, in a supervised way. Because you know what that original audio was, you just added it together to get the black audio. Um, these are waveforms of audio, those squiggles. Uh, and now you could recover what was the original source audio. Meanwhile, we observe that faces some, to some degree reveal what we expect a voice to ah, sound like. You look at those people, do you have a guess of who said that? I think you do, yeah, and like this one was phase two, maybe this one as well. Um, cool, and, and you can see that in, in daily life. I gave you the answer accidentally, so that was him. And so what are the properties that you're looking at or able to parse to know this? It has to do with how uh, things like the body shape, um, maybe the gender, um, different aspects of the physical appearance that suggest what the voice will sound like, and that's just a fact. So there's you know, properties, measurements that won't always reveal everything, but give you a hint about what the speaker may look like or what the speaker may sound like. And this has been shown. Um, the key thing that we've been able to do is point out these are kind of joint problems. If you want to be able to recover in a noisy environment what a person is saying, if you also are able to model what their voice is likely to sound like, using those two pieces of information together, you can do a better job. And so for time, I'm going to move to the results. Um, what does that mean? Now we've been able to denoise a noisy environment like this. So here's the original. I haven't measured it, but it's cut down the noise um, to a point where uh, we have the right vibe that it's an action kind of place. Here's what the computer vision model, their audio visual model, would be able to extract. I haven't measured it, but it's cut down the noise um, to a point where uh, we have the right vibe that it's an action kind of place. Or my final example, 
No shortage of people speaking over them, each other, in the no, world. No, a no, I did not. Yes, no, you I did. did not. No, sure I did you not. Did. For are you going to give me full credit? credit? If you're talking am, to me now, am I, I gave you piece? full credit for that. Am I going to speak my piece or not? Okay, and we can separate for either speaker automatically, just giving that video. No, 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 I did not. No, I did not. No, I did not. Are you going to let, let me speak my piece? Am, am I going to speak my piece? Am I going to speak or my the piece other or speaker? Not? Well, you became a superstar. Yes, you did. Sure you did. From me, I gave you full credit. If you okay, so you can see like selective hearing and how that might mean for um, helping us in daily life in crowded environments where we want to listen better. All right, so I'm going to conclude here. There's been major successes in computer vision, in particular over the last decade, and there's naturally major challenges ahead. I think there's increasingly blurred boundaries between vision, robotics, audio language, and other adjacent areas. Um, and I think that a key frontier for that we need to put so much more attention on is embodied in first-person perception. And then I give you examples from the literature, from our research work, of what this can look like as we move forward. So thanks for your attention. Be glad to have uh, your questions in the Q&A.
Great. Thanks, Crispin, for a fascinating lecture. We're good. We have a great set of questions. We won't get through all of them, but we'll do our best so, to, to get to um, as many as we can. So first of all, what are some ethical challenges that come with this first-person egocentric content? How do we justify using the data from people? Yeah, great. So first of all, whether first-person or third-person, I think you know the data resources are something we have to take a lot of care for in, in terms of privacy and being rigorous about privacy and ethics practices. Um, but I think, as the question kind of alludes to, it even, seems even more important when you're talking about first person, because a lot of times you're talking about kind of personal settings, right, or daily life activity. And so we're, you know, in practice, for, on the data side, we're very mindful of this. And I think that, you know, the Ego 4D effort, which I mentioned today, was kind of, um, I think, uh, leading the way in this regard in terms of every institution collecting data. Um, doing um, prior, before any pixels were captured, like doing these privacy reviews, ethics reviews, whatever's um, for their respective universities to, in order to do this in a very um, controlled way. And what does that mean? It means things like um, consent forms for people who are capturing data or de-identification of data once it's been captured when, when that's necessary to uh, remove any identifying information. So, and I think, so that's on the data side. I think the other part that is in play here is to think about the future of applications, including in augmented reality, where you may have, you know, already we have many cameras in the world, some you might not even think about, um, but if in the future where I think we can get lots of value of having cameras with us even in a head-mounted way, um, that, that brings in new policy and privacy considerations that have to be um, considered from the start as such, you know, just a, a simple example, you know, what kind of approval you as a user give for how, how and when to capture data or when you have um, uh, agreement with others about in, in your environment about capturing or not. Great. Let's take a question from the studio audience. Uh, for first-person video, how does a model understand the invisible pose behind the camera? Is there some kind of labeled pose data the model uses to determine the human's live pose? Yeah, that's right. So the problem setting is when you train that model, you do have the so-called ground truth body pose. And in fact, in our case, we captured it with a Kinect sensor, which gets this, these 3D joint positions in the body. And then at testing, you have only the egocentric video. So you're learning the relationship between how the camera moves as you see the scene moving around the person and with their body and what that means about the body behind it. Great. Let's move on. Uh, there's a question about whether the egocentric model suffers from not tracking a person's eyes. Yeah. So eyes are a wonderful part of, you know, potential part of egocentric perception because as the question would know, you know, the way I move my head is a proxy for my gaze to a certain point. But in our attention, we might first move our body, then move our head, and then move our eyes. And so that's the finest grain um, signal about the attention in some regard. And so for current kind of captures, like on the data side that we and others are doing, um, we can use eye tracking um, on the glasses. So there's a platform called Aria and, and others in the, um, that are available commercially too that uh, have cameras looking at the eyes in order to do vision-based tracking of the eyeballs themselves. And yeah, what a wonderful signal to think about, you know, as a, just a stream of information about this egocentric actor's attention. Great. We have uh, maybe time for just one more question, and it's an important one because it's the central theme for you. So, so could you reiterate the difference between third-person uh, viewpoint versus first-person perception and why it's critical for the next frontier? Yeah, sure. So third-person means spectator. Think of a camera that... Um, is sitting looking at the world, and first person means doer. So it's the camera that's on the actor, um, on a person, on a robot, and it moves around with the person as they do their activity. And I think it's the next frontier because of that close link between agent behavior, intention, attention, um, and these visual observations that is just absent when you're talking about the spectator view. So this is new challenges for embodied AI. Great. Well, thanks for both an insight into the whole field of computer vision and especially for a view of your current ongoing research that's really leading the way um, in, this, in this field. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. There's some more great questions that we'll, we'll, on the chat, and we'll try to, to answer a few of them um, as we can. And we look forward to seeing you next week.